Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is musical director Bruce Mayhall and singer Victoria Lavin. Dr. Bruce Mayhall is one of those extremely musical people who at the age of five started lessons on the piano and through his teens he sang in the chorus, many choruses I think. He graduated from Harding University in Arkansas, earned a master's degree in music from Ohio University and a doctorate from the University of Oklahoma. Then did you go to work? Where did you go after all that? Well, did you start teaching? I did. I was teaching some in between those uh, schools. In those terms years? Of, yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, but I, I did start teaching full-time after. What after were work. you teaching then? I was teaching choral music. How did choral music come? Because you were a, a piano, a pianist, uh, what, a, a, a genius, let's say. <laughs> well, probably short of that, but um, I was a, I was a pianist, and then I was uh, interested primarily in musical history um, oh. in my in my early studies. But um, the conducting thing just kept coming back to haunt me. Um, it, it was practical for one thing; that's where jobs were available. You mean for um, the choral directing? For choral directing, and. Um, then uh, finally I stopped resisting and learned to really love it and, and that became my passion, far more than playing piano or musical history. So do you actually teach courses in that? Were you teaching courses in choral directing or yes. chorus or what? What would you teach? What was the, s the matter, subject matter? My um, responsibilities at the University of Nevada in Reno, which was where oh. I was just before here, right. um, involved directing choruses, um, an undergraduate chorus and a graduate chorus and um, teaching choral conducting to both uh, undergrads and grad students. So what specifics do the choral people need to be in the chorus and what specifics does the director need? The, um, <laughs> I love a statement by, by a, a great um, figure in choral music, Margaret Hillis, who was for many years conductor of the, of the Chicago Symphony Chorus. Uh, she, she said when being interviewed about um, analyzing music, and how much of this do your students know? And she said, none of it. It's none of their business. <laughs> so the, so. The, the part that they need um, is really very practical um, in terms of learning the music and, and learn, uh, capturing style and um, becoming passionate in their rendering of the music. So is it a class in choral music? Is that it? Primarily singing in a chorus. So it's, it's really kind of a laboratory experience. I see. Sort of a hands-on um, experience preparing music for concerts, not unlike what I do with the Gay Men's Chorus. But you must need more people than are in your class, do you, I mean, to have a chorus. Yeah, those classes tended to be rather large. Oh, uh, were they? Depending upon um, the level and the specific design of the group, anywhere from um, the smallest groups I conducted, there were 16 or so in size. Uh -huh. The largest were about 200. Oh. So it depends a lot on the, on the repertoire that's being, that's being performed. Well, you organize choruses. So in order to organize a chorus, do you have to audition? That's a very wise idea. <laughs> <laughs> you audition people. <laughs> right. It's a very wise idea. Actually, some of the choruses that I conducted um, are we call them y'all come choruses. These are choruses that anybody can can join. And they have a specific function and a specific role uh, to play. And then... Um, is that frustrating for you? No, all not come, at all. Or is it more fun? No, it's, it's really great fun. <laughs> it's really great fun. One re regularly sees light bulbs go on above people's heads and that kind of experience. And many, many people have a, a really wonderful experience. They're primarily people that are doing things other than music professionally. That, who come Who do it as an avocation and, and really enjoy it. It's a sort of an outlet for them, a stress reliever, if you will. So really? that's, al that's always marvelous. Um, but no, really, I, fo I found that very challenging and very, very pleasurable. So af after Reno, you 
I, I guess came to be the director of the Gay Men's Chorus, which right. is, you've been with them two years now. Correct. And you've done incredible things, I understand, lots Thank of you. recordings and, and put the chorus in the limelight. Um, how many people do you have singing there? We have about <laughs> 195 members of the chorus at this point. And is it just gay? No, we have we have straight people. We're we're non-discriminatory. Well, that's what I wanted to know because I thought, well, that's not a fair thing, is <laughs> no, it? <laughs> no, um, it's it's bad enough to be a men's chorus, I guess, you know. So, um, the, to the exclusion of women, um, but you don't have women though. We do don't you? have women no. in the chorus. We have only men in the chorus, and and that's kind of a unique um, experience too. Um, the, we have a sister chorus, uh, Vox Femina Los Angeles. Oh, you do? Um, that, um, that the chorus, the men's chorus, was instrumental in, in helping to get started. But this is a group of, um, of women who, who sing um, in a chorus together as the men sing in a chorus together. We occasionally do some things uh, with them. We had a performance in November of this last year that was a performance on their subscription series and then they're appearing next year in our subscription series well, as well. Well, it's talking about subscription. Where do you perform? We perform at the Alex Theater in Glendale. And where would they perform? They perform primarily at the Zipper Theater in the Music oh, Center. Oh, downtown. Mm -hmm. Oh, I right. see. Right. So you have a much bigger venue. You have right. a bigger chorus. <laughs> right, it's a much larger chorus and um, and really the, the Zipper is a very wonderful intimate sort of atmosphere and the music that they perform is, is very typically that kind of music, so do it's a little different kind of thing. Do you work with their musical director? She's a very great colleague and friend. In fact, oh. she's one of the reasons that I'm in this position. Uh, she was a part of the search committee oh. um, that, uh, that chose me for the position, and she was a, a friend that I had known in other um, prof professional involvements. And has she, did she start that chorus? Or has yes, she, she did. She did. Yeah, she was the founding director. And of who is it? Her name is Iris Levine. And uh, she, I think it's a great mix. She brought you in, right. a friend, and the <laughs> two of you did get together. Right. Uh, one of the highlights, because I saw you rehearsing, you didn't see me, oh, I wow. slipped in to the <laughs> Jerry Herman song. Oh, wonderful. So tell us about uh, how that, did you make a CD on that? Yes, we did. Um, that was really a unique and wonderful experience for all of us because we were able to work with Jerry from the, the very conception of the concerts. We thought of things that we might want to do and then spoke with Jerry about them and he was very very helpful to us in terms of um, the construction of the show putting it together and because it was a show it wasn't just a chorus standing right. up there you had right. people moving through the chorus through right. the, as I recall I yes. mean, I saw. yeah and it's fairly it's fairly typical of our chorus um, oh, it is. yes it is um, you know the b before MTV I guess um, the, the standard of choruses walking in rows and standing and yes, singing yes. <laughs> um, was, you know, was pretty well known. But, but since that time, since the, the, the culture has become so much more visual, um, it, we've, we've often incorporated visual elements into our concerts. And it's, the comparison to opera is not, is not untoward. Um, Who does that? You, the artistic director? There's a, there's a production committee um, mm. that, that, in, that includes a producer and a production designer and um, our principal pianist would be involved in that process. We have a musical advisory committee, uh, which so are members all, of the chorus, and we all, we all get together. It's a collaborative sort of so event. So you actually produce it together. Yeah, we do. Um, so we covered Jerry Herman. What about Elton John? Because you're doing a big thing with his music. Right. The, the chorus has, in the last several seasons, in its summer concert, um, devoted attention to a specific composer, um, mm. Sondheim, Rodgers and Hammerstein, last year Jerry Herman, this year Elton John. Oh, I see. So it's, it's kind of an interesting way for us to approach the work because it's a large body of work typically and with a lot of variety of styles and, and yet it's limited enough that it is one single composer's conception and Do, that provides some interest as does well. Does Sir Elton know about this? Yes, he does. <laughs> we've, we've in fact invited him um, to, um, to appear and aren't certain at all that that's going to happen. He's quite a busy man. <laughs> he is, but it, was he delighted that you were was, using his it, music? <laughs> he was delighted. In fact, we, um, we've created this concert with three other gay choruses, the men's chorus in Seattle and San Francisco. And they're Francisco. all coming together or you're and going to different venues? No, we're all performing the, the uh, music in our, own, in our own cities. Oh. But we got together and 
uh, commissioned the arrangements that we're using so that a number of the same arrangements are used in each of the cities. Oh, I see. And we're all doing them within a three-month span of time. All the concerts are happening within a three-month So months. does that save money? It does save a bit of money. Um, what we're finding, of course, as we, as we explore the process is that the uniqueness of the choruses and the uniqueness of the cities in which we function is creating some different sort of flavor in each of the concerts. So the, the music, there is a body of music that we're sharing and then each of, the, each of the groups is choosing some specific music for their concert. One of the things I think you've done with the Gay Men's Chorus is you've taken them on to TV. Ten Feet Under, Will and Grace, how do you become a part of those things? A lot of that um, happens because we are in the city that we're in. <laughs> and, um, you mean they need you? They, they need you don't someone. Push. <laughs> they need anyone. Um, oh yes, we do push. <laughs> <laughs> but do you um, use the whole chorus or do you use uh, just a few singers? Typically it's just a few singers oh, because see. of limitations of space and, and, um, and money as well. Mm -hmm. And so typically it's a very small representation of the chorus, in fact. And what's the difference between what you're doing and church choirs? Because I know you did uh, direct church choirs mm -hmm. and you started singing in church choirs. Well, there are some similarities in that there are both community kinds of organizations that are devoted to lifelong singing and music making. Um, the differences would be primarily, I think, in, in the broadness of the, the repertoire that we do in our community uh -huh. chorus as opposed to a church chorus that would be more specific in its literature, specifically religious music. And what about the uh, accompaniment? Would Accom that be different? The accompaniment is quite different. Most church qu choirs are accompanied by organ, um, sometimes piano, sometimes other instruments. But we're, we're pretty specifically um, unaccompanied or piano accompanied or small combo accompanied. Oh, that, so when I saw you rehearsing with the piano, that would be your accompaniment? In the, in the Jerry Herman concert, we had um, a small combo in addition to the piano. Uh -huh. The concert we just sang was just piano. And oh. um, so it would vary depending upon the music. Now, if you went to a venue that was smaller than the Alex where you appear, do you cut your chorus? What do you do? Well, we, do, do, you? we do, in fact, it's a really great question because in addition to the subscription series, we do about 25 community performances in a year. Uh. And these are just for, for individual events, civic events or events. Do you go into schools? We go into schools occasionally. A lot of them are um, things in the city of West Hollywood because our offices are, have been located in that area or other other things we've done things for the LA County Museum of Art we've done uh, a number of other so you um, can't take the 200 singers right. to that we typically take the number of singers that will fit in the space <laughs> um, oh, you're gonna say in the van <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that too, that too we're doing um, we're doing in fact four of those community performances over the next two weeks and they the, the size of the group varies from about 30 as the smallest sort of venue in which we're singing to <laughs> about 75 or 80 of the men. So it, it, it's really convenient that that happens in that way because most of the men have professional engage, engagements that wouldn't permit them to be uh, involved in oh, so you many can, of the community performances. So you can juggle it around. Yeah. Do they have daytime jobs? Almost all of them do. Oh, yeah. I see. Um, and so this would be... Um, the community performances are primary volunteer performances. Oh, that's so great. Bruce, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you came and told us about the Gay Men's Chorus. Well, it was a delight for me to be here. Thank I was you. so happy watching you conduct. <laughs> you were so intense. I, I, I'm a pretty happy man when I'm doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. And don't go away. We'll be right back with soprano Victoria Lavin. Welcome back. I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with singer-performer Victoria Lavin. Victoria was born and raised in Los Angeles. She studied at Utah University and Indiana University. And were you studying opera at that time? Yes. You were? Yes, I was. So you sang a lot of opera. Yes, I did. I started singing when I was 14. Was it easy to get started? 
Did you go to a company? Well, Albert no. Company? Actually, you know, in terms of studying, I just started when I was 14, and because of the nature of my voice, the teacher that I was working with was the head of the vocal department at a university oh. called Valparaiso University, and he just directed me to the music that he thought would suit my voice, and that's what I started to do. Well, were you were you just lucky that that happened? <laughs> that was such a great thing at 14. Well, definitely. I mean, I wasn't singing big, huge, heavy arias, lots of Mozart and, you know, a little bit of Puccini, things like that, things that were easy for a young voice to kind of assimilate. Yeah, I was lucky to have good teachers. You were a soloist uh, with the grant. <laughs> Were you uh, with the Grammy Award winner Vance George? Did I was. You work yes, with him? I did. I did the Bach B minor Mass for the Ventura Chamber Music Festival a couple of years ago. Oh. I was the soprano soloist. And what was his Grammy for? That particular um, thing. I believe that it was for a recording of the Bach B minor, and he was a wonderful conductor. I learned a tremendous amount from him. It was a great experience. Then you produced um, symposiums. You've worked since you've been <laughs> since you were 14 <laughs> tell us where we went from there oh, we went okay. on the opera stage that's right we i i did a lot of singing a lot of concertizing um the role of gilda and rigoletto the role of musetta in la boheme um lucy in the telephone you seem too small i guess we oh, got well. people <laughs> being very big with big voices <laughs> Well, I'm a coloratura soprano, so makes, yeah, so that does make a little bit of a difference. It's a light, high, very agile voice, right. And um, during the, oh gosh, it's been such a long time, um, late 80s, the Sundance Institute for the Arts, yes. uh, I uh, was looking to sort of expand what they were doing past film into all of the art disciplines. And so I was lucky enough to work with a company called American Opera Work Center, and we collaborated with the San Francisco go Adler Fellowship Program to produce oh. two or three symposiums on singing actors. So you, how many people did you have come to those kind of symposiums? Oh my goodness, hundreds. D is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. We had Tom Willis, who was the music critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, came as a symposium speaker. We had Christine oh. Bullen, who at the time was the um, uh, director of the San Francisco Opera Center, which was the, the training program. And they did it in San Francisco. You you did that. No, we actually did where? it at Sundance. So, but they were collaborative. Those other people were yes. a part of it. Yes. Oh, I see. So people, um, professors sent their music students probably. Well, actually, the singers were were, were the Adler Fellowship students who oh, had been ex who had been accepted as actual fellows and oh, were working for the San Francisco Opera. Oh, so they were really specific. Mm -hmm, I mean, very it specific. was very trained people. Yes, 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 young professionals in fact. Oh. Yeah, the director of that program was Dan Balistrero and They still have the program? You know, I don't know. Uh, well, they still have the Authorship Fellow Program, yeah. yes, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And then you became a member of the Pepperdine faculty. Just recently. That's just been, that's oh. just been the last 12 months, the last two semesters. Really? Congratulations. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great school. Uh, it's a, been a wonderful experience, wonderful students. Henry Price is the director of the vocal program there, and he is just a, a joy to work for. What do you do? I teach singing. I and teach singing. M men and women? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, music majors, music minors, um, and people who just do it because they love it. So everyone who comes to you already knows how to read music. They already know how to. Not necessarily. No? Most of them do. I would say you know 98 percent of them do. But those who are just taking the class because they sang in high school choir and they enjoy it, you know, they they may or may not actually be really articulate at reading music. They can take the class then. They yes. They don't have to be going into a professional no. direction. No, absolutely not. So, do, the, do you do any performances from your students? For my students? No, well, the students who are in your class. Well, actually, I have several students that have to do what's called juries at the end of the semester oh, and be do. graded by the other music faculty. And I have a couple of students next year who will be needing to do vocal recitals, you know, in order to graduate. So, so that's do, always fun to prepare for. Where do they do that? At the school? At the or? school. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it all takes place at yeah. the school. Well, then you teach voice in between on yes. your own. You have a <laughs> Where do you do that? I have a studio in Thousand Oaks, and I have a studio in Encino, and I take private students. But my performance uh, situation has been so busy since, oh my goodness, the last couple of years that my actual private studio has, has sort of, I've let that slack off a little bit because I've been busy performing myself. You have. We're going to talk about that. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about was 
founding Opera Unplugged. Ah, okay. Because that's kind of like a lead into what you're doing now. Well, Opera Unplugged is not your normal, ordinary opera company. <laughs> <laughs> Unplugged, it definitely is, and it's taking a little nap right now. Oh. Um, we did several productions throughout the Ventura County area, and um, it was a great experience to do that, and we're branching off into more educational programs at this point in time. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're trying to focus on is getting a little bit of music into the schools. Then you're performing as a cabaret singer. Yeah, I think probably so that's not a different your, thing. It, it, exactly, probably <laughs> not your average everyday ordinary cabaret singer if there is such a thing. That's one of the wonderful things about cabaret is that it's so unique. It's such an individual form of expression. So you can do any style. And you're, you're doing Glitter and Be Gay. You're doing a show called Glitter and Be Gay. Yes. So yes. tell us about it because I well, think it's interesting. Glitter and Be Gay is actually a tribute to Barbara Cook, who was the premier ingenue on Broadway, very, very celebrated ingenue from the 1950s through the late 1960s. She originated the role of Kunigonda, who the aria Glitter and Be Gay uh, was written for oh. in Leonard Bernstein's Candide. She originated the role of Mary and the Librarian on Broadway in The Music Man and won a Tony for that performance. She that was, was also a surprise to me. I didn't really? know Barbara Cook had so many roles on Broadway. You know, I think that's one of the things that really has motivated me to do this show is people know her as a concert singer because she's been doing that for the last 30 years. People don't realize the kind of Broadway career that she had. No, and you wonder, why does this woman have the, a background to be a concert singer mm -hmm. and you don't know and, mm -hmm. and the public doesn't know the background. So I was surprised she'd been in like seven or oh, eight more. Broadway, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but leads. Leads, exactly. And you're singing songs from all of those. Yes, I am. I'm singing from The Music Man. I'm singing from She Loves Me. I'm singing from The Grass Harp, which was the last actual musical performance that she did on Broadway. A wonderful song called Chain of Love. And um, did, did she ever have anyone else do this? Are you the first person who's done this? Oh my this? goodness, I don't know if that, I don't know if I have that kind of breadth of knowledge, but but truly, you know, I, I listen a lot, I go to a lot of shows, and again, one of the motivations was I love this music. The music that she popularized, the music that she sang on Broadway, it, it's just exquisite and moving and, and very substantive music and I don't hear as much of it as I would love to hear and so I think that's another reason I want to sing it. Did you sing, see tapes of it? How did you get? How did I? Uh, oh well I've listened to her. performances? I, I, I've seen her in person once mm -hmm. and I listen, have always listened to her. So you don't know her? I don't know her personally, no. That is amazing. Yeah. That yeah. you don't know, are you? I know just... people who have worked with her, uh -huh. Uh -huh, and we're focusing on obviously the Broadway career and then the two concerts that she did in 1975 and 1980 at Carnegie Hall. I think that's very amazing. Mm -hmm. Who's directing it? Clifford Bell, uh -huh. a very very well known and established cabaret director, and Tom Shell, who is the principal pianist for the Gay Men's Chorus. You just had Bruce Mayhill right. on. Is my is my musical director and accompanist. So do they have a say in what you're doing and oh, how absolutely. you do it? This project is a total collaboration between the three of us. It how is do you, a total how collaboration. How do you work together? Well, I sort of make a huge list that says, I love all these songs so much, I have to sing 200 songs, and they <laughs> pat me on the head and say, <laughs> That's nice, babe. Uh, and, and, and then we start to create a theatrical arc, and we start to tell the story, because that's something oh. that's very key to cabaret. It's about music, but it's truly about telling the story. And that is another reason that Barbara Cook is such a joy to do a show about, because she has a beautiful, beautiful voice, but this woman is the consummate communicator. The story, her ability to tell a story and move an audience, I think, is unsurpassed. That's very interesting. You start, do you actually narrate the story? Yes. In between, oh, yes. you do. Yes. So you talk about her life. Well, not her life, but her career. Her career. I mean, her career. Yes, where she started, the roles that she did, why she moved from Broadway to to the concert stage. Who writes that? Uh, Clifford and I. We collaborate. You write that. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of research and we talk to people and and we collaborate and write some things. So you you talk in between, then you sing the songs. Mm -hmm. Talk about who wrote the music. You talk about her as having 
singing these wonderful songs, but of course they were written by other people, weren't correct, they? Correct, correct. And she's always extremely generous, and I feel it's very important as well to obviously credit the composers who, who you know, have created this amazing music. And also, her collaborator is Wally Harper who is just a brilliant, brilliant pianist and arranger and, and also composer. We're doing several of his songs on the show as oh, well. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one big love letter, actually, to Wally Harper and, and Barbara Cook. And interestingly, my, my musical director, Tom Shell, saw Wally Harper many, many, many years ago at a performance where he was playing for a singer. And it was a life-changing moment for him. He decided at that moment, I don't want to be just a pianist. I want to be a pianist that plays for singers. So you found all the right combination because Clifford is like the Superb. genius yes, of cabaret. Is, totally. And it changes what you're talking about. It changes from Broadway music mm -hmm. that she was singing to a cabaret act which right. tells uh, which actually tells the story. Exactly. Yeah, that's very interesting. Exactly. Have you done TV work? No, I have not. Or film? No. You've just done stage. You've just, just stage. Just, um, and, and happy to stay there? I love performing live. I absolutely love it. I love the exchange of energy and, and just, you know, you'll hear a lot of performers say the love that you feel when you're able to connect with an audience. It's, it's, it's really something that's extraordinary. Do you uh, play an instrument? I play the piano. So can you accompany yourself? I can, but I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Public. Ever? Ever? Probably not in public, public. <laughs> not for real. I mean, I'm not a Diana Krall, that's for sure. <laughs> How do you uh, take care of your voice? Oh, I sing every day. Um, I take care of myself. I exercise. I try to eat well. I drink copious amounts of water. Um, Is that what you teach your students, too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like being an athlete. You know, when you're a performer, particularly um, if you're using your voice, which is quite delicate. That's what really. I wondered. Yeah, and yeah. you and when you perform, you sing every day, or right. you sing for two hours at a time. Um, well, I try and sing at least for an hour a day. So at that, least that doesn't strain it. No, no. I mean, it's rather like running a marathon. You know, mm -hmm. people train for a marathon, and they don't necessarily run. 12 marathons a year, you might only do three or four a year, but you train for it all the time. Singing's a little bit like that. Well, I'm so happy you came on, Victoria. Thank you very much for having and me. And glitter and be gay. <laughs> I love that. I'll try. <laughs> and thank all of you for watching the show today. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, 917 Los Angeles. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs>